Come sit. Oh, okay. <laughs> Just stay nice and cozy. Like, come, you want to come sit by mom so she's not sitting by herself? Okay, yeah, sure. Let's sit here. We're going to give you a lift. Oh. How are you doing, babe? Good, good, good. Yeah, she likes to she, she can't. <laughs> no, I was just like, she can't open the camera, I know. Where is it? Uh, I guess. Yeah. Did you just have a seat right there? I guess we're just going to sit over here. Okay. Uh, like, I, I feel like we should just all be sitting in a circle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we can. We can turn the table so, so, so that way it just feels a little bit more comfortable. Okay. I'm going to bring this down. You boys are fine. <laughs> The squareness matched the, the picture. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, give me a little bit of water while I'm back to the square. You arrive five. Now you arrive five seconds after it's finished, so only five seconds. I know. Late. I know. <laughs> good, good. That's good. That's right on. Yeah. Then you know you'll have to catch up with the, with the uh, movie. Yeah. 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 Thank you for joining us and for making it here. Hope you guys didn't get lost. Small kind of lost is our own too terrible. Yeah. Mahalo. You know, um it's it was standing of the clouds, right? Is that what? No? Um, temple. Temple, temple under siege. Oh, temple under siege! Okay. Oh, back in the day. Back in the day. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we wanted to set that foundation. <laughs> when, when Uncle Koo looked like a teenager and Auntie, Auntie Max was talking about popping awesome. the pillow. Awesome. And Noah. Noah. Yeah, it was a telescope. Noah's in there. <laughs> this is one oh, yeah. telescope. I remember. Yeah. <laughs> Kalamai for coming so late. We had um, all kinds of adventures on the way over here. We're just glad you folks came. Thank you for coming with mom, babe. Oh, thank you. Mahalo. The, uh, this is my, uh, this is our Okio leader. So uh, Noi is actually the daughter of Ubi Perkins and um, oh. Nicole Fields, who's been working with us for a long time since baby. Pretty much, yeah, yeah, and um, I think that um, her, his name, uh, Lilinoi, is very important in um, that you know being named after the goddess, a uh, goddess of Mauna Kea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and has always brought that Opio perspective. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm i very blessed with that name. I think I remember when I was uh, presenting at the uh, Board of Land and Natural Resources, uh, uh, what should I call it? Um, what is it called? The, the hearing? Or the, yeah, um, those hearings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I remember... The small kind of, room. Yeah, having... It was really, really intimidating because they kept kind of having a bit of a power trip over over the Hawaiians that showed up. Like, we're clearly there to, like, um, discuss UH's uh, control of the Mauna Kea. And I remember when I went up to speak to them, I had, the, I had like, a whole script written out, and then I kind of saw, I saw on the map that I was looking at of Mauna Kea, I saw, like, Pool of Illinois, and I just kind of started crying in front of those guys. So it was a really, that was my experience. It was awesome. Really, like, it we was all know that, that, that when you, like that ue is like mm -hmm. a sign of strength.
So it's a that's a real sign of strength, you know. I thought that was awesome. That testimony right there is Ikaika. Oh. <laughs> yeah, no, it was a really it was super sh like crazy day, very crazy experience, but I I think yeah, it was a very um we did get one person to vote against it. Do you remember? Uh-huh. And yeah. she was I think she was really Daisy Barnes. Yeah. Oh. She was the one person who was like was kind of standing up for it and was like, hey, people are clearly emotionally attached to this. So, mm -hmm. you know, isn't there a way we cannot do this? And it was like she was kind of speaking towards a wall, so Yeah. Was she the Hawaiian cultural? No. Was no, she, she wasn't. No. Was, was she the Kanaka? But she's kind of, she's kind of, you know, right now, uh, just in case anybody doesn't know, at this moment, we're in a very strange uh, time when 100% of the Board of Natural, Land and Natural Resources is Kanaka. Wow. They don't necessarily vote right. like it. Right. But it's important to know, you know, so, and uh, Amy Barnes is one of them. And she's not the one who looks very Kanaka at all. And, uh, she, but she's been kind of good, you know, as far as, I mean, you know, it's, BLNR is a tricky thing, mm -hmm. you know, but, um, but she's been pretty good. So she was, yeah. It was just a really striking thing to see one person kind of really emotionally affected by it and everyone else like, like so cut off. So is that a recent testimony? Somewhat recent, yeah. It was um, last year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that was still under Suzanne, or yeah, it must have been under Suzanne then. It was before. It was. It was. It was mm -hmm. before it took over. Yeah. So, yeah, and I don't know. Uh, I don't know how much you remember, but Illinois was actually around during the time that this was being filmed. That Temple Under Siege yeah. was. That's good. You folks help take care of her. Yeah, so um, I think that, uh, you know, speaking of t the whole temple under siege, it's, um, I really want to acknowledge Puhi Pao because, you know, he was my first mentor in the Hawaiian movement, my first, like, kupuna that was, I mean, he was like my age now when, when, when I was like probably close to your age, maybe a little, couple of years older. But um, you know, he was the first like actual elder, even though he, you know, he was like my age elder, but he was, he was the first elder that um, I was peely with in the whole movement because um, I was a student at UH and I went into um, the Department of Communication and I was studying video production because I had worked at this recording studio in Waikiki and was doing video down there and I didn't know what I was gonna do at UH so I was kind of like just sort of you know, playing music, kind of drifting, not really, like, I changed majors, like, several times. It was, like, eight <laughs> years. I was, I've been in school Long eight years school. already. Because I, because I didn't pass high school. I went, you know, I, I took a GED in my, um, in my uh, junior year, and tested out and then didn't know what to do so I went into Windward Community College, first Honolulu Community College, then Windward Community College for a long time. Then they were just like, hey, you like taking every class over here, get out. So I went to UH and kind of did the same thing. It was kind of drifting around, didn't really know what I was doing. And when I was doing that, I, um, <coughs> I met a few people. I met Kuka Hakalau, mm. who was a friend of my. I had this, I had this Irish boyfriend who was friends with Kuka Hakalau, and you know, 
we all kind of used to hang out together with Charlie Cooper, who was the um, he was the guy for the lobby. He was amazing. He was unreal kanaka who took care of the lo'i at UH at that time, back when, before it was a whole Hawaiian studies thing, you know, it was just, it was just the lo'i by itself, all by itself, no building, no nothing down there, no support, no nothing. And, um, so I was kind of doing that, doing little this and that, and then I had a, I decided to go into video because I was working at this recording studio in Waikiki, kind of as an offshoot of my music thing, and um, somebody told me, go talk to this couple, Joan and Pui Pao, and as it turned out, um, my boyfriend Phil, at the time, he knew them, and so we went over to their house, and you know, they were so, like, I never met people like them before. Because I wasn't in the movement at that time, right? I wasn't an activist, no nothing. And I went over to their house, and here's this amazing Palestinian Hawaiian man who's so striking, you know? And this really sweet holy lady who is just, like, so loving. And I was just like... Oh, I was kind of blown away. So I kind of talked story with them because I needed some footage from them for some for a class project. I was kind of like little blown away. I didn't talk very much. But then that same week, I was working late in the video production studio at the Department of Communication, you know, just doing my school project stuff on back back then uh, we used to use three quarter inch video which if anybody's ever seen that kind of stuff it's like the the tape is this thick and the camera is like this big and the and you have to carry a separate pack that it records on which is like it weighs like 40 pounds right and it, uh -huh. and it runs a recorder in it that was back in the 80s right so like a reel to reel but for video huh? kind of like that yeah yeah, yeah. So there are these big tapes they look like big like like a vhs tape but like three times as big right and um and you got to stick them in this pack and it records onto the pack and it like runs a cable to record it, right? So, so I was doing that kind. And um, I was working late in their thing, you know, and back in those days, it's like you had to, you had to, um, when you edit sound, you would have to use nail polish. No, seriously, you use nail polish because you cut the, you actually cut it with a razor blade. You cut the tape with a razor blade and you stick it together with nail polish, right? To wow. to edit the sound. It was like those, those, it was those days, right? And and this is in a high tech studio, right? Because this is what they do, right? And so, um, so anyway, so I'm I'm working on that, and this new thing had come out, Beta Cam, which was like, you know. We we're all learning beta cam, and it was like, oh, the tapes are smaller. They're only like this big, you know. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it was it was it was a whole thing, and so John and Pui Pao were on beta cam. But anyway, so I'm working late in this studio at night, and I'm like editing and doing all this stuff on these things, you know. Back in those days. Editing is like these huge machines and you have to run two tapes at the same time and then you have a third tape that they both go on to that you have to like physically switch them between, you know, it's a whole trip, right? Wow. When you think about what you do now. And um, so I'm working there late and uh, the studio director is kind of like letting me work because she's got work to do so she's you know it's like past hours nobody's supposed to be there but she's got work to do she knows i got a project to finish so she let me stay late it's really late and the phone rings you know a regular landline kind phone phone rings and i hear her answer the phone in the back and she says um she says oh uh let me check and so she comes out and she says, you know, there's this, um, there's a, uh, it's Pui Pao from Namaka Oka Aina. And, um, 
They want to know if somebody can assist them uh, tomorrow at the Aloha Aina concert because they need an extra camera person. Um, they just call to see if there might be any volunteers, right? And it's like <laughs> late at night when the place isn't even supposed to be open. You know, I don't know why they even called then, but I was like, okay, I guess I'll go. So anyway, I went down there, I helped them with that, and then next thing you know, we're doing stuff, you know. Um, I was never able to keep up with them because to tell the truth if you've ever seen my video it's not professional standards it wasn't then it isn't now it just is what it is you know my main thing is capturing that it happens that's great right. you know it's a, it's a, yeah, it's always a you know Oren gives me a hard time because it's always kind of like that you know i don't necessarily keep the horizon correct i don't necessarily keep it steady on one thing i'm kind of like all over the place catching this catching that you know it's I still film now about how I did then, which was not professional and it was never really meant to be professional because I realized that <laughs> even when I was getting a degree, I did eventually get a degree in it, I was never interested in doing professional video, you know, mm. but the best thing about doing video was Joan and Pui Pao because they are amazing, you know. They are uh, truly amazing. When you see this video, this is like, you have to understand the quality of their work. Mm -hmm. I mean, these folks, to get a B-roll, right? To get, to get a shot of like, you know, the, the wind blowing through the forest, that kind of thing, they'll go all the way up a mountain, wait and wait and wait and capture the right moment when they capture it. And then sometimes I happen to know that they would drive all the way down the mountain and then they'd go, you know what, we didn't capture, capture that quite right. And they go all the way back and do it again. You know, because no. they were so, so, such artisans. Mm. They would, everything mm. about their work was just, it wasn't that it was perfect. It's just that it was aligned with the true art of, you know, of Pono and Aloha Aina. Mm. You know, truly, like nobody could touch them, not before, not since. So I just wanted to say that about Joan and Pui Pao because, you know, I got to see Joan recently and, oh, I just love her. She's just, you know, they're the reason that I continued on. Because eventually, even <laughs> though I did end up getting a degree in video, I never used it. Because, you know, even though they strongly encouraged me, and I have to say, they were awesome. And I spent a lot of time, like, kind of struggling not to feel like I let them down because mm. Pui Pao used to get me jobs all the time. Jobs that I was not qualified for, you know? Like, um, he got me this job as the director of this TV show for uh, <laughs> Billy Beamer, who eventually became a, an OHA trustee, and she had this she had this TV show, and and uh, and I had to be the the set director, you know, to like tell the cameras, you know, camera one, camera two, you know, you know, zoom in, pan left, da 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 da, you know, all that kind of stuff, and I'm just like, right? what am I doing? You know, this is crazy. <laughs> So, um, it, but out of that, even though I wasn't what I would call a very good set director, I got to meet some amazing people because Leon Sue was doing the music 
for that show, and um, John Martin was the head cameraman. And, you know, so little by little, all of this kind of work, like, built things up where I learned, you know, and then I, um, I went and I took the UH camera and I went to the Vokele Opuna um, demonstration in, I think it was late 1989. It was like right at, before, before it turned into the 90s. Um, there was a big demonstration of Vokele Opuna protesting geothermal and a lot of people got arrested and it was the first time I was over there with a camera shooting through the fence while, you know, watching the police like take people down, you know, take down mothers, where there were the kids are right there, all this kind of stuff, you know, and I was just like, wow. And, um, and they ended up using my footage, you know? So it was kind of like, kind of got this a little bit of a working, relationship and got to see a lot of different things and um, yeah uh, and kind of got to see the other side of the actual movement you know and pretty soon from doing more of that I found myself putting down the camera because <laughs> there was too much that needed to be done to just film it, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, meanwhile, they're still getting me work. So Puipa got me another job, which was directing this PBS series, um, recording Kupuna. So I worked with Lilikala Kameelehiwa, who was the producer, and um, a crew from PBS, and we went to these places like um, over here there was Catherine Mauna Kea in Waianae mm -hmm. and um, you know many others many other kupuna they were looking specifically for a kupuna who were manaleo you know who olelo Hawaii and could teach in olelo Hawaii so um, you know I um, I did that but really what I really wanted to do was do the action action kinds of stuff and um, eventually I think uh, eventually I met my baby daddy Hanaloa who you know was a, you know it was like a classic thing where we we're both at a protest against a Gulf War and he had a megaphone it was his first time as an activist and I had a video camera I was videotaping him and then um, very romantic. Yeah, and then later Pui Pao <laughs> and Joan said, you know, they, they, they later on Pui Pao said, um, you know, why don't you teach him to do video? So then we, we, I did, and so he was doing video, we were both doing video, and so um, we did it on a lot of stuff, but then in 1992 there was the action at Iolani Palace when um, they were arrested, Hanaloa, Kekailo, uh, Ke uh, Kalekoa, um, Bumpy, uh, and a lot of that crew were all arrested on the steps of the palace. And that, and I videotaped that, right? I was up there on the steps with them videotaping. You can kind of see like a little bit of my footage is in the tribunal uh, video and in Act of War you know, where they're getting dragged off the steps. And that was the first time I witnessed true police brutality, you know, where mm. they were getting literally brutalized. Michael Grace from Kauai was dragged down the steps bleeding because he, I wore rubber slippers, you know, to uh, the thing and it was just like this long streak of blood down the, down the palace steps, you know, and it just, you know, it made me really feel like, wow, having a camera, it's like on one hand it was good because I was able to document it, and on the other hand I was like, what am I doing standing here mm -hmm. with this camera, you know, mm -hmm. when this is happening, I just wanted to go there and, 
you know, and uh, be part of that action, you know, because it was so, it was kind of, it was very, it was very intense, you know, and uh, I mean, they actually like beat them, beat them right there. And um, so it was, um, and by the way, I should mention that the reason that they were on those steps is because they had a permit from DLNR to be at the palace for the event and DLNR at the event revoked the permit. They revoked the permit at the event while the event was at the bandstand. So when they realized that they were either going to be arrested there or have to leave, they could not give in to that helva. So that they rushed the palace, not because they were trying to take over the palace, but because if they were going to get arrested, they made a decision that they would rather be going to make a point there at the. Yeah. They would rather be at the palace than at yeah. the bandstand. Right. So, um, I just want to set that record straight because it looks like you know they're trying to like rush the palace, but they were rushing up to the palace. So that they Just wouldn't stand be their arrested from, from the yeah. bandstand, yeah, because because it wasn't right for them to be taken from anywhere. What was the event? It was uh, Kamehameha Day, mm. in 1992. So I just wanted to say that the, you know I just wanted to say that uh, Joan and Pui Power and I and I have to say that during that whole time there was always they were just this huge support like you know as I kind of like got into activism it wasn't just the video it was also Pao would call me up and sometimes I, I, when I wasn't home he would leave a message on my answering machine and he'd like play the ukulele and he would like <laughs> say he'd be like this is a message for Laulani. <laughs> you know, and, 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 like make up songs and stuff. It was just he was awesome, you know. And so sometimes I would be feeling so down and traumatized by all, you know, you know, you, you guys all know how it is, a friendly fire and the you know the drama that happens and the conflicts in the things and everything you know and it was like they were uh, they were like a serious rock so that was it was really amazing and then then uh during 1991-92 uh what another thing that happened from working with them i started working with Kawai Puna Prajin and he was amazing he was that guy was like the most classiest freaking guy he was like i still remember i still have somewhere i still have my welcome letter to the movie i, I call it that it was it was just a a letter that he wrote me you know on his letterhead that he had you know and um for the uh Hawaii Coalition of Native Claims, which he and Liko, well, that was their organization way back, right? Which eventually, ironically, their, that 501c3 that they started changed its name and is now called Native Hawaiian Legal Corporation. Wow. Yeah, so um, they still got Liko's typewriter. He wants his typewriter back. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, so. Um, Kawai Puna was like a lot of people don't realize he was like the force behind a lot of things you know like the first landing on Kaho'olawe he's the one who called everybody who was on that boat up you know and got them onto the boat you know and he was the one who um, he and Liko made the first Sovereign Sunday happen in 1977 you know wow. um, <clears throat> which was called All Hawaii Stands Together, you know, and then continued, he was the one who continued Sovereign Sundays down at the palace and turned it into Sovereign Sundays from just that one um, commemoration, 
into that. And so Kawaipuna and Pui Pao and a third mentor of mine named Kamakahuki Lani Von Olhofen from Waianae. They, all three of them, they were my very, very close mentors and all three of them were students of Pilahi Paki and others, you know, definitely other kupuna too were really important. Um, but Pilahi Paki is very important because she's the one who prophesized that when the world, um, you know, in its quest for peace, basically when the world falls apart and in its quest for peace, the world will turn to Hawaii because Hawaii has the key and that key is aloha. You know, that's her, fa that's her famous quote, but she had a lot of, <laughs> eh, it? Um, she had a lot of famous sayings and a lot of just a huge knowledge you know, very powerful, very powerful kupuna. And so, um, so all three of them who are my mentors, those mentors were her students. And um, Kawaipuna passed away very abruptly in 1992 on his birthday. His 49th birthday. Young then, yeah? Yeah, he was young. You, you would have thought he was older, but he was only 49. And um, and uh, it was, it, I, I, I was with him the day that he passed, and it, uh, it, was, uh, it was, it was an interesting series of events when everything kind of happened on it. The, um, the little coffee shop that we had, like a little activist hub down there in by university, the coffee line, which was eventually taken over and became something else, but. Um, to be was that? To, to a yoga shop. Oh no, oh, yeah, the next oh, building the other over. Yeah, 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 it was like, it was taken over by this guy that, um, we kept that name, but it was definitely a different thing, but it was like a serious kind of activist hub anyway. As soon as Kawaipuna died, one day not too long after that, that was April 1992, and not too long after he had passed away, one day um, I go outside of my house and Pui Pao showed up at my house and he was wearing a beret. Still remember that he was wearing he was like a, wearing a full on beret, you know. He just looked like a you know, he's like he's he, he was so noble, you know, in his Palestinian Hawaiian like, you know warrior look, you know, and um, he told he told myself and Hanaloa that we needed to first of all that we needed to take over Kawaipuna's international work was what he actually asked. Then he said we needed to go to a meeting, and the meeting was at um, Ethnic Studies, which at the time at UH, which was at the time was in these little portables in the back of UH, and um, that's where we met. Well, we had met before, but where we got to know Kikuni blazed up because it was his kapako kau. Mm -hmm. which then morphed into the uh, Kolo Kolo Nui Komike, which was the uh, basically putting together the international, the People's International Tribunal. So, um, yeah, then we became part of that organizing committee for the tribunal, and that was a whole adventure for a long time. And meanwhile, um, Kawai Puna died in the middle of the battle over H3, and so that was, um, yeah, it was, mm, it was, it was right in. 
habitats, but anyway, so in uh, later in 1990, in, in April 1992, the, it was like things happened so fast because April 5th was when the Wahine again, Kauai Puna was like, he was this background instigator for so many things. Like a lot of times he would, you know, he would be on camera sometimes, but not too much. He wasn't a big, like, you know, show up on camera kind of guy. He was always in the back, always making things happen. Always like he'd get the money to make things happen. He's the one who, um, actually the, the uh, knowledge that we have about what happened during the overthrow. I mean, everybody thinks it's just like regular history, but at the time, people didn't know that stuff. And he got a big grant and got um, and sent Melody McKenzie and John Van Dyke to Washington, D.C. to do the research, and they brought the research back. And that 1977, First Sovereign Sunday was Number one, it was the first, you know, the thing was called, the event was called All Hawaii Stand Together. It was where Liko's song was released, the first time it was played in public with George Helm, um, Harry Kunihi Mitchell, uh, uh, Juana Salazar, um, and just like a lot mm -hmm. of those guys, right? Randy Kalahiki and a lot of these guys and um, Kawai Puna. And, um, and it also was the place where they released the information on what had actually happened over the overthrow, which is now is like common knowledge, right? But people didn't know it. People didn't have that information. That was where it came out, right? Mm -hmm. so, um, so anyway, so after that, you know, so he, so he was like the force behind that. Him and Biko, but, but he was the force behind that. And then behind Kaho Olave, behind the actual going on to Kaho Olave. And then he was also um, the force behind what happened in Halava Valley because his friend, Barry Nakamura, who's like, Barry, is this, like, he, I think he's in this movie, wasn't he? I think in, in, in uh, maybe, no, 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 maybe it was in the other one. Uh, but. Anyway, Barry is like this real geeky Japanese historian, right? Who like totally knew his stuff really good. So Barry, who played music with Kabai Puna uh, and Kupuna Tamaunu Pao, the three of them would play, play music all over the place, <laughs> all over the place. And um, so Barry got fired from Bishop Museum for using the H word, hail, because he said, it's a hail, of course it's a hail, I'm a historian, this is, you know, da 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 da, this is like, how obvious are you gonna get? And they didn't wanna say it was a hail because they were employed by the Department of Transportation to say it was not a hail, right? Mm -hmm. Bishop Museum was, right? And so they fired him. Okay, so. And um, so, Kauai Puna organized a protest down there, and uh, Joni Hui Pao came, and then I came to videotape that protest, and at that protest, this bunch of Hawaiian wahine, who only kind of sort of knew each other, they all decided, after meeting with Kauai Puna and kind of little instigation kind of happening, they all decided that they were going to go up to Halawa Valley and hold it. And they did for many months, right? And so they, um, they had an encampment up there. We all had an encampment because, you know, we, they went up. I went to go turn in my footage and you know um, do a press release, and then climbed up there right after them in the dark through the riverbed, and um, we were all up there for from April to August, and in that April, um, that's when Koi Puna passed away abruptly. So so he had kind of instigated that to happen. That was on April fifth. And then 
he passed away abruptly on April 14th mm. after a legislative meeting. Anyway, he had just come from the Capitol and um, I saw him and anyway, it was, he, came, he came back to Coffee Line from the Capitol and then he passed away. But, um, so I was talking about this movie, about the Mona, about, um, so from that, you know, uh, <coughs> shortly after those things in the 90s and the tribunal and all of that that they were part of, they moved to the Big Island. And that was really hard because it was so hard to be far away from them. But we would go over and visit, we went and stayed with them. And Ke and that's when I got to really know Kia Mahapishoda was in around 1999, actually, because um, uh, our common mentor, where I said there was three of them, right? There was Kawai Puna, Pui Pao, and Kamahuruki Lani Von Ohafen, who were students of Pilahi Paki. Mm -hmm. And so Kamaka, who was at my baby's birth, the baby who was in that movie with the in telescopes, you know, the, um, uh, Kamaka, Kamaka got sick and she passed away in 1999. So that's when I really got to know Kealoha Pishoda, who was uh, in mm -hmm. that, um, in that movie too, and was already a full-on leader of Mauna Kea in 1999, you know, and was all by herself basically. I mean, there was like Uncle Genesis Niloy um, and a few others who were uh, kupunas basically, who were involved at that time. But it was just Kealoha, and she had already been through several battles by the time like I actually went over there after our common teacher Kamaka passed away you know then I went over there to support her more and more when she would have her things you know and um, and uh, you know got to know her and her partner Kale and um, and yeah and, and we would go and stay with Pui Pao and Joan uh, a little bit and you know just spend time with them and they were all so focused on the Mauna you know it's just such a huge thing even then and there was no even talk of TMT there's no concept of it and it's that's kind of really important because when it first came up the first time it was mentioned we thought it was nuts. We thought, they're, they gotta be kidding. They're not gonna actually try to build this. It was crazy, you know, they wouldn't, they wouldn't do that, right? I mean, it's like, that's, you're talking about something that's like two football fields big? Two stories high. Mm -hmm. that's, that's insane. We thought it was just like, they were just pupule and just, you know, I mean, we still kinda think they're pupule, but you know, we thought they, it was just one of these things that people had this idea and then that they would uh, not follow through. At least I did. When did that buzz start? It? 2000, this was 2003, right? When the outrigger, the Keck telescope most of the footage in here was from 2003, I believe, because at that hearing that is on the, um, the video is largely 2003-ish, right? So I would say it was around 2006, I want to say, mm. when the, f do you guys know, time-wise? Uh, 2010, the initial. Where was it? 2010. 2010. Oh, 2010. When they actually filed the thing. Yeah, when they were filing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I would say it's around 2006 when we first heard the word of it, right? And I don't want to say that we didn't take it. Kealoha knew it was going to be a thing, right? 
I didn't think they would actually keep trying because they sent, um, it was 2010 when Peter Adler's report, was that the, was that the, okay, so, so they, they hired this, um, this guy, Peter Adler, who was like a really well-known mediator in Honolulu, and he, um, they hired him to do this report to see about the feasibility of TMT. And he interviewed Keloha and she told me she was going to this interview and I told, you know, I kind of told her, uh, just, you know, so you're gonna tell them that the Kanaka are gonna kick their ass, right? <laughs> you know, just like, like you're just gonna tell them straight up, right? That like, they, it ain't gonna work. They're not gonna build this thing because it's, you know, there's, they don't have any hope of doing that because the people will stop them. And she did tell them that. She totally said it loud and clear and was in the record. And when he reported it, he changed what she had said, she and others, you know, mm. and like tried to like kind of soften it up and make it sound much more, you know, nicer. And that was a very expensive mistake on Mr. Adler's part for TMT. So, anyway, um, we were talking about Temple Under Siege. So, Pui Pao, Joan and Pui Pao, they, they carried The vision, you know, literally, Namaka Okaina, the eyes of the land, you know, they carried the actual vision of the kupuna, of the future generations. They knew what they were doing. What they were doing was recording the now to connect the past and the future. And Pui Pao's really deep man so such a beautiful strong pono person just amazing and um, he really understood you know because he came to his activism through Sand Island when he was arrested for trying to live at Sand Island. You know, because he was a fisherman. He lived out at Sand Island and then all of a sudden the state came and cleared everybody out and bulldozed everybody's stuff. And in comes this beautiful Italian woman with a big camera, you know, and she was filming the whole thing and next thing you know, they were a team. And what a team they were. And, um, you know, so I, uh, I, I think that it's important to um, see that, you know, they really represent like this whole balance of so many things that makes up what our movement is, you know, the, the, the video that you watch now, I mean, it's in focusing on the Mauna, you know, the Mauna is that key that Auntie Pilahi was talking about, right? I mean, I think we all know it, yeah. right? It's that key, Auntie Pilahi Paki, who was the teacher of Pui Pao and Kawaipuna and Kamakahukilani. She talked about that key of aloha that will unlock world peace, that can unlock world peace. 
and there it is. Mm. It's there on the Mauna, and that's why they stay very close to the Mauna. You know, it's um, that's it's the temple, it's the temple. You know, um, the whole thing is this sacred place on which the highest prayers. I mean, it's not just that it's the highest point in the entire Pacific Ocean, which is the largest object on Earth, right? Not just because of that. It's because it carries these prayers that are like so sacred and it you know, whereas, um, you know, Mauna Loa is like this palace territory, right? And there's, there's all this like, you know, um, creation, different kind of creation, right? Creation of the Aina and all of the drama and all of the, you know, sometimes violence, you know, it's all of that that happens on that mountain, right, and here, right next to it, there's silence. That's one thing Kealoha always used to say is that, you know, the prayer for the Mauna, more than any other prayer, is silence. And it's true that it's, it's, it's right there, but within that silence, is everything you know it's creation that it's a silence that creates so i think that it's it's really important in this temple under siege it's really important to understand that that's the idea that people had at that time when this was being made and also in our time when this whole movement has been made has been um, about carrying that prayer forward, the key of aloha, you know, and the harmonization, the, the, the one of the things Kabaka Apukilani used to always talk about, and she kind of would kind of do this a little bit with Pilaki Paki, and partly on her own thing was the, the sound, because from silence, you have sound, you can learn sound, right? From darkness, you can learn stars and light and time. And the sound, whether it's the sound of a voice, sound of poo, you know, the resonance is what carries um, that, you know? So there's a resonance to the silence itself and then there's a resonance to all of these these things. So um, anyway, I've been kind of talking a long time, but, <laughs> but I did want to just share those things as a background to the temple under siege, because I think that it's important, you know, the, to know a little bit about the context of the filmmakers and Oh. Their power that they're they're more than filmmakers. They are more than filmmakers. They're you know agents of the great, the grand artiste, as Kamaka used to say. You know the um, they're agents of aloha. Mm. Mm. I think that was great. Can't follow that at all. <laughs> uh, just that I, th I feel um, really blessed to. I just feel blessed to be here right now and kind of hear this kind of stuff to know where my generation is gonna go with this fight. You know what I mean? It's with this like Aloha warrior movement because I, I, I think it's it's just we have to really watch and listen and learn as much as possible because eventually it's going to be kind of our thing, you know what I mean? 
So I'm just happy that I'm here in this moment so I can learn some stuff. So well, that's my kai, but you know, the one of the fortunate things is because of uh, Puhi Pao and Joan folks and everybody since and before them, you folks are more empowered because you're more informed. You know, like how you say that Puhi Pao had got the monies to go and send uh, Melody Kauai, and... Kauai Kuna did, yeah. Oh, Kauai yeah, yeah, Kuna. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So yeah, to go and get that. that. So things that we take for granted, mm -hmm. you know, and like we tell the kids, it's like, well, you know, it wasn't always like that. You know, so they get to just walk the path that was set. Yeah. Yeah. You know, somebody yeah. else had to clear that path for them. So to me, it's like we look forward to this uh, generation because they have been so informed, so empowered, and so woke, mm -hmm. and you know, have seen the struggles of the people so that they can have that strength to go on. Because it's not going to be easy, because America, this fake state isn't going to give it up easy. But yeah. you know, we, we just got to keep telling the truth and keep uh, holding them to their Christian, so-called Christian values and moral fortitude, which they fail. You know, especially in the capital, they feel it so often, mm -hmm. and um, in too many places of power. It's it's a sad thing, but that's what they have to deal with. Um, so what Laulani did is, you know, part of our serious questions for the documentarians was to ask, you know, who was your inspiration, who was your mentors, you know, and, and she just rolled right into it, <laughs> and, and you know, so you know, what inspired you? besides that and help you to choose where you where you're going to spend your time because you know there's so many fires and even today there's so many fires all over the place that it's it's hard to figure out who's going to do what and who's going where so you just have to try and uh, make your best decisions right and for me I always saw you in front of the camera <laughs> I, I didn't even realize that you had your your degree until Orrin had shared that. And I was like, wow, really? I only see her in front of the camera. You know, so I, I think that was that was really awesome, you know, for me to learn that and and even a deeper about Pupi Pao and and um, Joan. So grateful to them and even Kawai for she I've only heard the name, you know. I I'm, I'm sure I'm aware of some things but I haven't made that connection. And the third person, Kamaka her brother still lives in Wainai Valley. Von Ohafen. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So it's my own neighbor somewhere up there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're classic, classic family. Uh, just really powerful warrior. She was, she was amazing. She's a, she was a star person. That's actually that's how Tia Aloha and I. Kind of got together, and I think that's really how um, she's one of the people who like really was focused on Mauna Kea early on, and she was very close to Pui Pao. So yeah, she was uh, she was amazing. <laughs> what I found interesting is that uh, for many people, you know, in the TNT thing came up. It was as if it was a reaction, and, you know, to something current that's current in the news. But to hear from you that the, the thoughts of, about the threat the Mauna was many more years earlier. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. That was so. You cannot say that these are just people reacting. Yeah. 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 Well, that was insight. You know, um, so I'll try and frame it like this. So I can definitely see how aloha, kapu aloha, um, like how it changed the world, right? At least for us in in the, in, in Mauna Kea, right? And I've been familiar with uh, Kumu Pilahi's uh, message, you know, for a very long time. And after seeing it happen, I really do um, believe that, that that prophecy that she shared will come true. I don't know, and I'm, so I'm going to ask if you feel comfortable speaking to Humo Pilahi's um, teachings, right? I don't feel that it's always going to look peaceful. Like, 
in our strictest, in our strictest um, code of conduct, when all else fails, like, we might inflict violence on ourselves and die, right? In order to make change. It, do you think that an action so, um, so drastic would fit in um, Kumu Pilahi's vision or in her teachings? Okay. Um, hmm. It's like a hunger strike for you. No. From, I mean, I'm a generation down from Auntie Pilahi, yeah? so I learned from her students. Um, and definitely one of those students, I'm going to say straight up, died in battle. You know, um, I have to say that when we're in the flow of aloha, and the flow of Pono, we know what we have to do. And sometimes it leads to things that are hard, for sure. I don't think it's up to us what to be called to do at any one moment. If it's coming from our mind and like a strategy in that way, I'm going to say that the kupuna wouldn't want us to die. They would want us to live and carry on the aloha to the, to the next generations if it's up to us. However, if we are doing that which we are called to do and we give ourselves completely over to the spirit and are following that path and we're doing so with discernment and pono, and if that path leads somewhere where we may be faced with that, then I think that any one of us who is truly a warrior will stay on that path of Pono wherever it takes us. Ew. Ew. You know? We don't know what that's going to mean giving up. It, hopefully it's not our lives. Hopefully not. You know, it's not what the kupuna want. They don't want to lose us because each one of us is very valuable. And part of being the key to peace of aloha, being that key to peace on this earth, means it's time for the killing to stop. And that means killing ourselves too. So that that is important, you know. That it's it takes a lot of faith to go beyond the idea that we're going to have to use violent force, even if that violence is against ourselves that we're gonna to have to use violent force to make things right because that idea is where war comes from, right? That's where all of this destruction comes from. It comes from that idea that rather than 
me being in the place of Pono that the Spirit puts me, and you being in the place of Pono that the Spirit puts you, and you being in the place of Pono where the Spirit puts you, so that we're all here together, right? Instead of being in that place, it's the it's that place of we're gonna make something happen, whether you know what whatever it is, we we are going to force that to happen, you know. So that that sense of force is what has led to um, to violence, and by violence, I don't mean defending oneself. I don't mean um, I don't mean not being angry. You know, because self-defense and anger in the in a certain balance, if they're in a certain balance, it's they're part of that they can be part of that path, right? If they're in balance and if they're in a place where that, um, that, uh, that pono, that greater pono and greater aloha is manifested. But I think we saw on the mauna, right? On the mauna, we saw what it, what it really takes, right? That, that's it right there. That's what these guys have been saying. That's what Pui Pao was telling me on the phone, on the message machine. You know, it's it's what Kawai Puna said. It's what it's it's what they've all, what everybody has been saying is that we have that key. We have it inside of us. We can stop any bulldozer. We can stop the entire military. We can stop any destruction we can turn it around but in order for us to do that we have to accept what that's actually going to take yeah. and what that's actually going to take is a whole lot of stuff you know it's a whole lot of making things right with people so that you can stand together. You know, it's it take it's gonna take a whole lot of um, educating ourselves so that we have the tools when we're ready, when that stand does happen, we got what it takes. We have the experience, we have the skill, we have the knowledge, we you know, that's what a warrior now is you know is to have all of those things those are our those are our weapons those are our tools mm -hmm. is to to have the words when the right words are needed to have the music in some cases when the music is needed to have the chance mm -hmm. to have the um have a video you know like this film to have all of those pieces to have the opio to have the kupona to have all of it right we because in order to win we're gonna need it all right and sometimes we might lose mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean we're not gonna win mm -hmm. right, right? Yeah. Exactly. and i think that that's i don't know if that's an answer to the question but i think that that that's i mean um, I, I was just thinking of like all of our, like in, it, in, in in essence is like the giving of one's like right? it's the un the unconditional love that, that empathetic compassion you have for somebody or the next person and the greatest expression of that could be to give up your life right yeah. so what is aloha right you know and we can go down her acronym and then we could take the esoteric meaning of it too and and i was just wondering if you know you ever had that conversation with somebody that comes from that thinking, right? I think for me, you know, it, it does. I, I hear your mother and, and I appreciate it. <clears throat> but for me, <clears throat> like, I'm looking for, I'm, I, I feel like that's how I'm going to die. Yeah. You know, and I, I just want to do it when I feel like it will make a difference. So. Well, one person.
person I can say that one of my other mentors who's, who's part of that whole time is uh, Uncle Dico, you know, and, um, you know, uh, Uncle Dico, he is close personal friends with Hawaii Puna, with George Hell, with Eddie Aikau, all of whom lost their lives, you know, they all gave their lives, right? Mm -hmm. to help others, all mm -hmm. of them, you know, and it was really heavy. Kimo Mitchell was the son of Harry Kunihi Mitchell, you know, and um, none of them, like, chose to do it as an action, but they didn't back down in what they were doing and they did it to such a high frequency and each one of them did so much that when the time came, you know, that, you know, when, when George just felt the calling, he had to go paddle out on Kaholave to a surf, on a surfboard, you know, that's what he had to do. He was called and he had to do it, you know. When Eddie Aikau was on the Hokulea, you know, and they were getting pulled out further towards Tahiti, you know, an upside down canoe, you know, and, uh, and some of the people on that boat were terrified and starting to panic. He said, I'll go. That's the last anybody ever saw of him. You know, in Kawaipuna, it was just one hearing, one action after another, after another, after another, after another. What actually killed him? I cannot say. I was there, but I still can't say what it was. I know that a day before, a day and a half before, you'd gone up to the big hole that was to become the H3 tunnel, and he did something up there, and he was never quite the same after that. I know that. I know that an hour before he was, maybe a couple hours before, maybe a few hours, when I saw him, he was sitting in a chair at coffee line with Satu Okubo's little dog watching the McNeil Lehrer report on the old TV we had at coffee line, you know, and didn't want anything to eat, which he'd never been before, and he looked all oh, beautiful, he was like, oh, I was like, I was like, oh, did he brush his hair? I think he brushed his hair. Oh <laughs> you know, <laughs> he was all like radiant and glow. He was literally glowing. It was like, what is that? We were just kind of like, what is that? But then we left, and an hour later, they found him in the bathroom. You know, and um, so I'm just saying, I don't think it was something where he made a choice to like give up his life mm -hmm. nor did George Hell, nor did Eddie Aikau, nor did many of the others you know Kahale Smith maybe yeah <laughs> but um, you know but by following their path they were the ones who were chosen for that it's not for us to choose I guess that's the idea. I think I have it. It's not for us to take life, whether it's our own or anybody else's. I wish we could go on, but we're, we're already like 10 oh minutes God. past our time. <laughs> so I want to thank you folks for coming. Uh, August 7th, we're going to come back and we're going to um, have the attorney perspectives of the Mauna Kea. Uh, but again, it's not limited to the Mauna, but that is what has called us together, uh, as it did when we went up there. Um, so we're glad to have to host the Kukulu uh, 
Mauna Kea series exhibition here. So but we're also going to expand on the Waianae. So August 7th will be our next get together. So Anna, Julian, bring your friends. Do come back again. Pictures are going to be available when we're open from 8 in the morning until 4.30. And anybody can come in for that as well. Yeah. So this is an ongoing exhibition, but it will be about every other week is when we'll have the lecture series. Um, but yes, the exhibition is available and we will be looking forward more to our digital uh, exhibition. We're just waiting on some submissions or more submissions. Yeah, so I want to thank Lucy and thank you, Danny, for letting us stay a little bit longer. And for everybody for coming out, especially you folks. Mahalo. 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 So if everybody can help me clean up. Let's start with putting those tables back.